Welcome to another episode of the Wine Scholar Guild podcast. I'm Valerie Caruso, a wine educator and your podcast host. I'm excited to be sitting here with award-winning author and Decanter Magazine columnist, Jane Anson. Jane is the author of Wine Revolution and Bordeaux Legends, the 1855 First Growth Wines, and she leads the Master Level Bordeaux Study Program. Welcome, Jane. Hi, Valerie. It's lovely to be speaking to you again. How are you? I'm doing well. It's been about two years, so I'm excited to kind of catch up on some Bordeaux here. And I understand you've got some exciting news. So can we spill the tea on your new book and where you take us inside Bordeaux? Sure. So I have been spending really the last three years working on a big, huge book about Bordeaux, (laughs) which I am now counting down the days until publication. I think we're going to get the very first copies in March, just before the En Primeur but the official launch is on April the 21st. So yeah, it's coming up quickly. And can you tell us a little bit uh, about this book? When you say large, I know how many pages this book has, but you talk about the maps that you're going to have. Let's let's talk about what we're going to dig into this book with. So I really hope and feel getting excited about the fact that I think this is going to be a new, a really a new conversation about, about Bordeaux. What I've tried to do is to take people behind the scenes, not just of the estates, but also of Bordeaux itself. We're going a lot of going underground and looking at the terroir and looking at the, the different the impact that the different bits of Bordeaux have on how the wines taste in a way that maybe we won't usually do with the Rhone or with Italy or with Burgundy, but we don't tend to do so much with Bordeaux. So what I've done is work with the really the brilliant researchers and cartographers and geologists who live here and we've come up with completely new maps either sometimes I've gone into um, researchers who've had maps that they maybe did years ago that have been hiding in their desks and drawers the whole time and I've got them out and taken them to the the cartographers and the the scientists who have who have reworked them and say what we're going to find is beautiful maps showing all of the different bits of gravel in Bordeaux, all of the different bits of limestone, the different bits of clay, and just trying to put it together to show you in a clear way what difference will it make, what impact will it have on the taste of the wine, and in different kind of vintages, where should you be looking to get the the best value. So it sounds like not only in addition to those of us who love wine maps and who study wine pretty much for a living and consistently, it sounds like there may be a different angle as far as learning about Bordeaux through this book as well. I, I think there will be. Certainly for me, I have learned a different angle of, of what, you know, what I knew about Bordeaux before. I've definitely found it's deepened my understanding. And the other thing that's lovely, it's a 700 page book. There are 65 maps within it, but they're not just static maps we've got wonderful gatefold so the book will open and then you will open again to have really beautiful full-scale maps that will go over four pages in a gatefold so it's I think it's going to be useful as well you know you'll be able to easily look and see what it is that we're trying to say with these maps. I like how you said that the maps will fold out because for those of us who have to wear reading glasses and have to squint at single page (laughs) maps that is actually really good news. I agree it makes it much clearer and we have kind of fun things like on one double page there'll be an area showing kind of what the soils are like underground and then on the other side of the page it will be exactly the same area but it will be showing where the chateaus are and what you know other information so you basically you'll be able to put two maps almost on top of each other so that you get a layering of information. Oh that sounds so exciting and since it's been about two years since we've talked about Bordeaux I'm curious I'm sure the listeners are curious to learn what either is the latest or what is it that you learned about Bordeaux in the process of putting this book together that you didn't know before? A a lot, (laughs) tons of things. (laughs) Um, One of the things I really enjoyed was getting to know Appalachians, which I, I, of course, I knew, but that I didn't have such a great understanding of or even respect for in many ways. And a, a great example of that would be La Londe de Pomerol. So, Most of us, when we come to Bordeaux, Pomerol is such a wonderful appellation and we tend to go there and visit the estates there and maybe not spend so much time just over the border in La Londe de Pomerol. And for this book, what I've tried to do throughout is to give as much space to the smaller appellations as to the big guys, because every estate that I've put in this book 
I want there to be a reason. I'm not just writing a two-liner saying a bit about the history. Every time I'm trying to say, what's happening in this estate now? Why should you care about it? What are you going to find? And so that meant I, I spent a lot of time in these other smaller appellations. And a really cool thing is you, you leave Pomerol, which as any of you who've been to Pomerol know, it's beautiful, but it's small and it's kind of flat. You head just over a tiny stream into Lalonde and suddenly you get much steeper. There's, there's parts of Lalonde where you can stand on the top of a hill and you're really looking down at quite steep slopes and you have the same really sticky clay that's so sought after in Pomerol in certain bits of Lalonde. So I got to know estates which I really didn't, I'm so happy now that I know them and know to buy them because they have absolutely brilliant um, terroir, brilliant, you know, the, the beautiful places and gorgeous wines, which are often half the price that they would be if they were over the border. I think that's important when you said you know how to buy these wines now, because I'm listening from the perspective of of a consumer um, who was gifted a bottle of Bordeaux for Valentine's Day. And and I'm looking at it and I'm like, yeah, I know a little bit about this part of Bordeaux. And I can't remember where it was from, but it was one of those things where I'm sure the consumer faces that wall of Bordeaux. And maybe it would be nice to understand a little bit more about, oh, Lalande de Pomerol, you know, and, and the different grapes and the soils that happen over there, as opposed to, like you said, across the stream or across the river, excuse me. So I think that's going to be important from the consumer perspective as well, not just the wine student. I, that's what I've really tried to keep in mind the whole time, because I'm a wine consumer. And the other thing that I've tried to do is I went to the scientists and to the geologists and to the you know, real experts. There's a guy called Kees van Leeuwen, who is a Dutch professor who's been here for years, and he was really the scientific advisor on the book. But what I've done is think, oh, I'm not you know, a scientist. <laughs> I'm none of those things. I don't have that expertise. What I have, I hope, is the ability to take what they're saying and to turn it into normal, clear language that is understandable for, for those of us who are drinking the wines. You know, what does it actually mean to how the wines will taste? And that was in my head all the way through the research process. And I love that this is coming out, like you said, right before the En Premier. If you wouldn't mind, I know the book launches in April. Can you share any launch party events that are happening around the world? So we have um, the first launch will be in London on the 21st of April. And then Two days later in Bordeaux, I'm actually doing two events in London on the Tuesday and the Wednesday, and then I have to get a very early flight on the <laughs> Thursday back to Bordeaux, so fingers crossed the flight is on time. And then we are in Amsterdam at the end of May, and in fact, Amsterdam is the first public facing. It's in a beautiful, beautiful old bookstore that is called, I hope I don't get this wrong, called Shel Sheltema, Sheltema Bookstore in Amsterdam on the 28th of May. And that is for anybody who wants to come, I'm sure we'll have some lovely wines there. It's really, it's a stunning bookshop. I'm really excited about that. And then New York and Washington in June. And then we'll be over in the West Coast, California in October. That is a whole year. And that's the one thing that if you, listeners, if you have not been to a book launch, a wine book launch, there's usually wine at that event. And I think that makes the rollout of the book that much more special and kind of brings you into the fold, you know, pun intended, if you will, a little bit better. So I don't know if a lot of listeners might realize that, that a wine book launch can be something so special. And you do you do feel closer to the content when you are able to listen to the author sip the wine from that region and really get excited about what's inside the book. Definitely agree. <laughs> and you were, you were asking about um, some of the other new things that's happening in Bordeaux. Yes. Well, so this is something which hopefully as well, some of these wines will be at the book launches to taste. But I was just this morning at um, the launch of the new Cru Bourgeois system. So, you know, the Cru Bourgeois have gone, the, the name Cru Bourgeois has been in Bordeaux for centuries mm -hmm but they've had a couple of false starts of trying to make it a, a real classification where in 2003 they launched a classification with three different levels and it got taken to court and it had to be annulled in the way that has sadly happened with a few rankings in Bordeaux. So they've gone back to the drawing board, reworked it, and just this morning they announced the, the, the new um, Cru Bourgeois system. So that's been something exciting and I hope, really hope for them that it, that it works this time and that they are able to, to keep the chateaus happy enough that, um, that there's no, no legal battles afterwards. But basically that this new system will be in place for five years. So if the, these are just Medoc estates, 
and for the next five years they will have the this ranking of coup bourgeois and then they apply again and i think they're hoping that because it's only a five-year period even if chateaus are not happy they're not going to complain too much i think the problem before was when it was every 10 years then chateaus if they were feeling disgruntled went to see their lawyers so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see what happens I'm, I'm happy for them that they've finally got something back off the ground and there's some really great chateaus that have been made it to the top of the ranking so names like um chateau lillian ladwis chateau le croc chateau le stage chateau Melisgas, some really really nice estates to, to, it's good to see them being rewarded today jane are there uh, any details available about how those rankings are assigned did they talk about that at all they did. So, so let's imagine that they didn't give us exact numbers of how many people applied. So, but we can imagine last time around, around 400 chateaus applied to be a Cru Bourgeois and about 260 or 70 made it. And that's been the case this time as well. I don't know how many applied, but I know that the final numbers, um, there are 179 estates that are actual Cru Bourgeois and then 56 that are the next level up, which is Cru Bourgeois Superior. And then just 14 have made it to the top of the ranking, which is Cru Bourgeois Exceptionnel. And you said this will be in play for five years. So, five, yeah. So from the 2018 vintage and for the okay. next five vintages from 2018. And then the, then the whole process will happen again, um, I guess, in 2024. Is that right? 2020, 2025. And the whole idea behind the five-year chunk of time is to hopefully mitigate some of the litigious <laughs> things <laughs> that go it. on. That is there. me extrapolating, but I am sure that must have, they must have thought, how long can we make sure that the chateaus feel comfortable that they can market, you know, that they can make the most of this, but not so long that they get <laughs> stressed if they haven't made it to, to exceptional or, or superior. And when can we expect to see some of those uh, those labels in the, I'm going to say the stateside market, because yeah. that's where a lot of us are? Well, interestingly, they were just this morning talking about they have two big um, marketing e e um, export budgets that they have set aside for this year. And those are America and, and Asia. So I know that they will be in the States actually within the next the 2018 vintages are now bottled, ready to go. So I think you're going to start seeing those in the States really okay. in the next couple of months. But, you know, this is a difficult time for Bordeaux in it, both of those markets in China and in the States right now. They have all kinds of things to deal with, which is um, going to, I would imagine, making making this launch a bit stressful for them. I was going to mention the T word, but should I not? Yeah, yeah no, I think we should. I think okay. we need to go there because it's a, you know, it's a problem that like we've, we've just seen the, um, the results of the sales of Bordeaux specifically into the States. And I believe in November of 2019, so just after the tariffs came in, mm -hmm. I think there were 45% lower the sales compared to November 2018. So that's just one month. And, you know, people are, are, have, are getting, coming to terms with what's happening, I guess, and trying to find workarounds. But there is no question about the fact that this is having a significant impact on Bordeaux. I figured it would. I did see, and maybe this has changed since I last read, that the 100% tariffs are not going to go into effect, but the 25% tariffs are going to stay in place. Is that? That's, that's exactly right. And in many ways, that's the worst of all possible outcomes, because if a 100% tariff came in, you can guarantee that everybody would be around that table immediately finding mm -hmm. a solution. 25% is still a devastating tariff for everybody not just for the producers but for the people in the states who are trying to bring in these wines and you know etc everybody down the supply chain but it's not so much that people are that it's you know that it's getting people to the table necessarily to find a solution so i think that i think that people here in bordeaux are very worried about that and then you have the issues with asia and then you have brexit coming at the end of the year so you know, I, I, it's not a, it's not an easy year for the borderlake no, absolutely not. And I'm sure as you do your book tour, you'll probably hear it from the smaller wine shops, like where I buy my wine. He he does mostly imports. And that's, you know, that's the bulk of his business. So absolutely, I understand that's an issue. We're not going to solve that issue today, but I appreciate you drawing some attention to it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that we as consumers, we, we have to talk about it and, you know, do our best that we can to convince whoever in our local um senators, our local MPs in the UK or whatever, that 
that the wine consumers are, import, are important and the wine industry is important to the economy of a country. And I think if anything, you know, just one more point on this, that it, it maybe has drawn attention to political issues that maybe wine consumers or wine purveyors or importers or distributors or retailers may not have maybe they paid attention before but i i've seen just such an uprising in the last couple of months and people actually going to the trade website writing their senators and i don't know if that's yeah. been such a big thing to do before i mean people know they should be doing this but how many people have really done it before this last uh before january 13th of this past year i totally agree with you it has been very it's a shame that it's had to happen but it's been very interesting to 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 watch that there has been real engagement from consumers Absolutely. So I think it is incumbent upon us if this is something we love, you know, to pay attention to those things and not just let everybody else worry about it. But um, with respect to some of the other things, like you mentioned the Appalachians like Lalonde Pomerol, were there any other producers or Appalachians or things that surprised you that we'll find really exciting in your new book? As I said, one of the things I've really tried to do, and I feel so pleased looking back, is to give respect and space in the book to the small guys who are trying to make a difference as well. So let's say there are 7,000 chateaus in Bordeaux, perhaps. So I've probably mentioned about a 1,000 either chateaus or wines. So that's you know, a tiny fraction, but it, believe me, it was a lot because I haven't had a team of researchers going off to, to do this for me. It has been me doing the research and the writing and the tasting and the visits of all of them because I, 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 you know, I want to impart and I wanted to learn about it. I wanted to impart what, what I what I know about Bordeaux. So how I how I picked who was going to be in. You'll of course you have the iconic names. You have the classified estates on the left bank and the right bank that everybody's covered. But where I then so let's imagine that takes us to four hundred big name estates. And then where I filled the rest of them, it's people who I think deserve to be known about. So I've done an awful lot to look at anyone who's doing organic, biodynamic. I managed to track down a couple of orange wines, oh, yeah. and natural wines, um, unusual varieties. So people who are doing 100% Petit Verdo or 100% Sauvignon Gris, you know, all of these kind of things that, that maybe we don't think about so much with Bordeaux. And I've tried to put them very much to the forefront and there's some amazing people who are working with ungrafted vines as well. So there are a couple of estates which are right by the Dordogne River on the right bank. And because they are so close to the river, they get flooding, sadly. But it has meant that some of their vines have remained untreated since phylloxera. They haven't had to regraft the rootstock because they've had one of those natural things that protected against phylloxera at the time, which was water which was flooding so i've uncovered all of these really cool and surprising small details and, and fun fun estates that maybe people didn't know about and certainly lots of them i did not know about either that excites me because that's one of that's one of the things that that i like to talk about is i call them fringe wines but mm -hmm. When I say fringe, I don't mean, you know, so unusual that you'll never find them, but just the thing that you don't normally expect to see. When you say orange wine in Bordeaux, I would have never thought. Or, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and I found two of them. Only two, but they're there. <laughs> right. And then you 100% Petit Verdot. And isn't there, is there still an estate that does 100% Carmenere? Um, yes, there is an estate that does 100% Carmenere. And um, the places where I found the most unusual are Castillon area and uh, maybe some foie but a lot of those coats do unusual things so again borg and bligh you'll find quite a lot of malbecs not a lot but you know four or five producers that do 100 percent malbec up in borg and bligh that's been really interesting too yeah those are the things that i get really excited about so that gives me something to look forward to in the book and that's probably the section i'm going to go to first <laughs> but we were talking about a little bit ago when we talked about the tariffs about engagement and maybe even a little bit of activism which kind of makes me think about global warming and how bordeaux is affected by global warming and how they are reacting i know i've seen things in the past about experimenting with different grape varieties i don't know if they still you know maybe spit when they say that. I don't know. Could you talk to us about that and how it's addressed in your book? Sure. So, I mean, that's something which has become a much bigger deal really just over the last couple of years. Um, as you say, quite rightly, that they've started now I, introducing the idea of new grape varieties. Important to say that at the moment, 
it is only AOC Bordeaux, AOC Bordeaux Superior, and AOC Bordeaux Blanc, so the, the, the basically the basic appellations and the coats, which are allowing this idea. So none of the big appellations, Poyac, etc., they're sticking to the traditional grape varieties, that's that. But the, but the other appellations are entering to the possibility of having them. So there are tests and trials going on. The question has been asked to the European Union if it will be allowed and we'll know more in 2021. So nobody is yet putting any of these different grape varieties in. I expect it to happen. I expect that in 2021, they will get the, the right to, to try new varieties. The other thing that's happening and that I've been tracking quite a bit in, in the book is there are parts of Bordeaux which could grow different styles of wine and which haven't done traditionally. So we have this really awesome temperature map done by a, by a guy called Benjamin Bois, who is a professor who's a, a now a very respected researcher who works between Burgundy and Bordeaux. And he's done this temperature map which shows that the strip next to the Garonne River, so the, the strip of vineyards which are next to the river, or the strip which is around the city of Bordeaux, or the strip which is near to Pomerol, etc., will always be, no matter what the vintage is like, warmer than other parts of Bordeaux. So you can get like a 10 degree difference between certain parts of Bordeaux and other, and that will be true vintage in, vintage out. Now, what's interesting is traditionally, those have been the really sought after areas, obviously, because we're by the ocean here. The difficulty has been traditionally ripening sufficiently but as temperatures get warmer, those areas, which have always been a lot hotter, are also at risk now of higher alcohols, of over-ripeness, of all of the problems that can come from global warming. So you then look at this map of the temperature and you start seeing the places which could potentially be great in a few years' time because they have been a little cooler, a bit more difficult, therefore a bit more rustic tannins, some you know green hints, all of these things that happen if, if um, fruit doesn't get ripe enough. So it's a it's a new way of looking at at Bordeaux and seeing where where could we be potentially if we get another vintage like two thousand and three look for the cooler parts of the map and are they actually going to have done really well in that kind of a vintage? Okay, so you, they've actually taken it and looked at it in a more optimistic way. It's like, oh, hey, we've got some untapped, mm -hmm. promising places to expand on in the future, and. I, I want to just ask, I want to go back to the new grapes. It's been a few years since I've probably kept up on it, and I do plan on talking about it in the near future. But I remember seeing Syrah, and that actually Syrah was one time of the original Bordeaux blend. But what other grapes do you think, or have they talked about adding to the Bordeaux blend in the future? Okay, so so the new varieties which they're discussing, which again, are at the moment they've requested them, but they have not yet been accepted. But okay. there, are, there are seven, I think, which are particularly interesting or that they're particularly hoping for. Um, one of those is a grape which is much more typical in, in the port area that's called Tarriga Nacional. Another one is um, Marcelin. Marcelin is a, is a cross between Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon. And that is one which is planted quite a bit in China and which actually I've tasted some really good ones from Ningxia in China. I can see that that one could potentially work here because of this, this you know, link with Cabernet Sauvignon. Then there's one called Castets, which was planted widely in the 19th century in Bordeaux. I've never tasted as 100%. I've tasted it as part of a blend, but I've never tasted it as 100%. Um, it, I think it's quite high acidity. We'll, we'll, we'll see. And then there's one which I really know very little about that is called Arina, hang on, Arinawa or something like that. A-R-I-N-A-R-N-O-A. If anyone okay. would like to tell me how I should be pronouncing <laughs> that, I'm, I'm ready to hear. Okay. Um, so no, no, none of them are particularly well known. But that's, I guess that's the point. What they're trying to find is grapes which are resistant, which have high acidity, which, you know, which are going to keep giving flesh and interest to the wines. And then there are three whites, Putty Manseng, which is pretty well known, used quite a lot in the southwest of France. And then one called Alvarino and Lil Liliorila, which I, I don't know very much about that one at all. The other two I've tasted, but Lil Liliorila, I, I really don't know much about either. But again, same things they're looking for. High acidity, I think, is the key okay. and structure. I have to say, I'm a big fan of the Petit Mansang. <laughs> I am too. I am too. I'm really hopeful that, that they will find it interesting. And at those lower levels, this, you know, the smaller appellations, then it, it, could, it could be interesting to see, to see what they can do. The worry is that right now Bordeaux is doing so much work to 
connect with its terroirs to work out you know how to really really make the most of each different plot of the vineyard and how to make it taste best with what they have and the worry is that it'll be confusing to add a whole new raft of grapes and it will again take away this idea of Bordeaux being authentic so that's what I would worry about for them. So maybe it'll have to be like a gradual addition and watching the ch- tasting notes change with yeah. you know the phenolic ripeness that some of those grapes will bring. And Yeah, I agree. In fact, on exactly that note, something I've noticed in the last couple of years on the right bank, particularly in Santa Million, is that more and more people are using Cuti Verdo because it's resisting to, you know, Mal- Merlot is getting so high in alcohol. So quite a few estates, the Couvent de Jacobin is one I'm thinking of, Yon Figiac, another one, that have planted quite a bit of Petit Verdot. Actually, when you're tasting the wines, because often at, at on Primeur, you know, you're tasting a, a long line of, of wines from the same appellation mm-hmm. and they stand out. And the first couple of times that I tasted them, I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. That's not typical of the appellation. And it, I, I found it hard to, to kind of think where I'd place them. Now I'm starting to, to really enjoy that little bit of Petit Verdot in those wines. But I think it's worth asking the question. And for the chateaus, it must be a little concerning because they're, it's, they're taking a risk adding new varieties. Right. I have to believe, though, like you and like me, I only started tasting wine seriously about 20 years ago. But the first thing I was looking for was what's different about what do you have that stands out? And I want to say there might be a a decent amount of consumers in the market that are looking for, hey, (laughs) what's different about this wine? So I would hope. I agree. In fact, one of the most fun tastings that I have done in the last couple of years was of the Cote de Bordeaux. And the criteria that I went in for with the tasting was I said, show me all of your unusual varieties or what, what's going on that's different so anything that was made without sulfur or that had these things we were talking about Sauvignon Gris or you know whatever or an orange wine I wanted to see all of them and it was such a fun um, tasting and I came out of it really energized and excited about about what was happening in Bordeaux and that's not always how you feel after you've tasted you know a, a hundred wines but to come out of it thinking oh you know this is cool there's a lot of people doing something different was really fun Right. And if you're the producer, you want to be remembered. Yep, I agree. You want to stand out. Well, we were talking about connecting to the terroir, which it sounds like your book does an amazing job of doing. So I'm so excited to see that. So can we kind of transition into this immersion trip to Bordeaux that's happening later this year and what can, we can look forward to? Excellent. So that is being held in October, the 4th to the 9th of October. And this will be the second time that I've done a trip with you guys. So thank you for asking me back. I first did one in, in July of 2019. And it was a great week because the people that come on the trip are just so interested and interesting and ask great questions. And it was really, I really enjoyed it. So we decided to do it again this year. And what I wanted to do this year was to take people to the vineyards during harvest, because there's something to talk about during harvest. It's a real window into how a wine region works, you know, how, obviously how wine gets made, but really the politics behind it as well and the, and the atmosphere. And it's not something which is easy to do unless you're being brought there by somebody like the Wine Scholar Guild, you know, like somebody who actually has an in, a connections into those estates because it's not a time of year when they tend to be open to the public. So it was a risk. I thought, you know, let's see if we can get it, get something working. And we have. So we've got some really great estates. So we'll be there for five days um, going to places like Chateau Cliné, Chateau Angelus, La Consciente, Figiac, you know, really wonderful names. I think we've got, to, we're going to Lafitte and to Mouton, um, to Margot, to Bechevel. And it's really, so, so we're beautiful estates. And I've also tried to make sure that we go to some of the smaller estates. We're going to Fronzac to a brilliant property called La Dauphine, which is organic, biodynamic, doing a lot of these new things that we're talking about. And it's some of them, people are going to be able to have a harvest lunch at one point. We're, we're working on trying to taste some grape must so as it's just come in yes. off, the, off the vines. So people can really get a behind the scenes look into, into how um, harvest works. I think that is a magical time to be doing a wine tour. I'm not a middle of the summer kind of person. I would rather be there at harvest. And like you said, who better to take you inside Bordeaux than (laughs) Jane Anson? Jane, is there anything else that you want to say about your book or the tour or whatever before we sign off today? It's perfect. Thank you so much. Well, I guess the only thing is, is that we are arranging there to be a, a discount for Wine Scholar Guild 
people. So I think there will be a 10% discount that, and I will at some point very soon have a code for you guys to, to be able to put into the sites to get it. Excellent. And listeners, to find out more about this study trip, the Bordeaux Master Level course, and the member discount on Jane's new book, Inside Bordeaux, go to winescholarguild.org.